Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. Today we have a very special episode with a slightly different format. We usually have a discussion of entrepreneurship and the freedom it can bring to your personal life. But instead, today's episode is an in-depth conversation about Bitcoin with two of its earliest pioneers, Roger Veer and Eric Voorhees. Both Roger and Eric were very early Bitcoin entrepreneurs who have funded and founded more companies than we have time to announce. It it has gone very quickly from like a, a joke of people online to the way finance is going to be done and everyone's jostling over the the details, not whether it will happen or not. We find out how Roger and Eric met each other at the first Bitcoin conference. We discuss the Bitcoin scaling debate in depth that has divided the Bitcoin community. We find out their thoughts on the recent altcoin surge and of course, their stories from the early days in Bitcoin and dive into the predictions about the future of cryptocurrency. Is it the absolute number of full nodes that is important for decentralization or is it the percentage If you'd like to be notified when Liberty Entrepreneurs releases new episodes, head on over to our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com, and subscribe with your email. You can find the show notes and all other relevant information posted on our website as well. This is a really exciting interview. I'm really glad that we were able to get Roger and Eric on the show at the same time, and I hope you enjoy this most excellent discussion. So welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm very pleased today to have my co-host Justin Blinko, as well as Eric Voorhees and Roger Veer with us. We're going to be discussing a lot of Bitcoin today, so I hope everyone is ready. So Eric, Roger, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. I can't imagine that anybody in the Bitcoin space don't know who you guys are, but just give a very quick bio, Eric, and then Roger. So uh, yeah, I'm Eric Voorhees. I currently run Shapeshift. Uh, which is a digital asset exchange to convert between Bitcoin and other blockchain assets without any uh, user accounts or signups or friction or anything like that. Um, Notoriously, I I was also the the founder of uh, Satoshi Dice and I've been involved in a number of other Bitcoin companies over the years. Um, I've been involved since 2011 and so that makes me kind of an elder elder Bitcoiner at this point. From the old school. From the old school days, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Roger Veer. Uh, I guess I was the first person to start investing in Bitcoin startups and uh, met Eric at, at the very first Bitcoin conference ever in New York City in fall of 2011 mm-hmm. when Bitcoins were a couple of dollars each, I think, maybe at that yeah. point. And, uh, they were about $8 yeah. on their way down from 30 Right, yes. And uh, but we still felt like we were on the verge of changing the world. And yeah. here we are a few years later and we are on the verge of changing the world. Absolutely. Um, and then I think one of my favorite things that I've done, and I don't know how appreciated it is in the community, but uh, I set up BitcoinStore.com, which was the first big website to start accepting Bitcoin for hundreds of thousands of products. And we sold millions of dollars worth of products for Bitcoin. And that was before we had Overstock and, and uh, Newegg and Tiger Direct and all these other companies that are accepting Bitcoin today. And I kind of feel like that was a big catalyst to help move the whole ecosystem forward. So that's yeah, one of the, the things I like. In the early days, people would always say, well, what can you buy with it? Right. And like... Early on, there kind of really wasn't a good answer. Alpaca there was the, I was going to say alpaca socks. There was the alpaca farm <laughs> up in Vermont that sold alpaca socks. Uh, you baklava? There was, uh, yeah, there was some baklava. That might have been later, though. Um, but Roger's like, well, I'll show you what you can buy with it. You can buy anything. You can buy, like, 10 million products with it. At uh, prices competitive with Amazon mm-hmm. and everyone else, too. So it yep. worked out pretty well. No one, no one asks what you can buy with Bitcoin anymore. Not really. No. That battle has been won. Tell us more about when you guys met and which conference was this and like, did, you, did you know about each other prior? No, but I, I, I'd like to tell this story because it was a really interesting experience. So we were at the New York conference and I didn't know Eric and Eric came up to me and just said, I think we should talk. And I said, okay. And then uh, he said, you know, I'm involved with the Free State Project in New Hampshire and we, I think we have very similar interests. And the part that stuck in my mind the most, you know, here we are about almost six years later, he handed me his business card. And his business card said, I'm friends with Satoshi. <laughs> and it had his, his name and, and email address and maybe a phone number as well. But I thought that, uh, wow, this guy has a pretty memorable business card. So uh, Eric's always been very good at marketing. And from the very first time I met him, that that was one of the most memorable memorable business cards I've ever received in the, ever, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Eric, you'd known about Roger prior to that conference. 
I think I I think I may have known about Roger maybe from Free Talk Live. Mm-hmm. Um, I th- I, th- I knew about Memory Dealers, and so Roger sort of indirectly through that. When I first talked to you, we were at that eatery, that like bakery place in New York. And it was dinner. The staff there was accepting Bitcoin, and but the, all the apps and systems were so terrible. There they was no BitPay yet. There, there was were no, no BitPay. There were no app wallets. The BitPay guys, Steve and Tony, were there. Yeah. Uh, that, they were just getting their company started. So this restaurant actually accepted Bitcoin, but just to have Bitcoin on your phone required having a full node <laughs> on your phone. So well, I, I had my girlfriend's Android, and it had uh, like a six gigabyte node on it, which we thought was ridiculous because that was the size of the blockchain back then. Yeah, and maybe the entire storage of the phone back then. Yeah, she made me kick off the, the node after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I remember Roger saying something about um, Hayek or, or some Liberty guy, and I, I was like, yes. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, it was the start of a good relationship. So you could run a full node on your phone back then. That's not possible today, most likely. Maybe there's some phone that could do it's it. It's still possible today. Is it? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. The blockchain's what, 70 gigabytes? You can buy 128 <laughs> gigabyte SD cards, 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, There's no reason that people should run a full node on their phone, but even today it's possible. Yeah, Yeah. so let, let's segue into the, this, this <laughs> scaling debate uh, that, that's torn the community apart in the, the last few years. I think it's asunder it's, is the right term. Asunder? Asunder. It's torn it asunder. Yeah, so the first few years of your guys' involvement in Bitcoin, there wasn't a... Uh, lightning rod of, of disagreement. Everyone pretty much agreed in the direction. This has kind of come about over the last two years. So how have you seen that evolve and well, there, how do you see it maybe being solved? There's always been a lot of controversy, but usually there would be like five or six or ten sides to the argument. And so everyone would just kind of bicker about things. And then on the next issue, they would all be on different sides. And so it was like a very sort of decentralized argumentation <laughs> platform. But there's always been drama. I mean, when Satoshi Dice launched, I, I was ridiculed by a number of people because I was polluting the blockchain, mm. so using it for a, a reason that they didn't approve of, which I always, I always found silly, but that was highly controversial. But even then, people had like nuances to their arguments, and so there was, uh, it was a rich discussion. And I think it, today now, unfortunately, it's, it's much more polemic, and the block size debate has turned people into like two distinct camps or that's the perception, at least. And then the, when there's two distinct camps, there's always a there's always the tendency to just vilify the other, right? That's yeah. just a human nature situation. Yeah, we see this in politics all the time. We see it in politics. We see it in religion. We see it in sports. Right. If I can take a moment to specifically vilify one side in the argument, <laughs> the, the big block side should be ashamed of the censorship that's been going on and not even allowing the people that are... I'm sorry, the, the small block side should be ashamed of the censorship that they've been having uh, on both, you know, our Bitcoin, BitcoinTalk.org, even Bitcoin.org. Like, we're all Bitcoiners. We all should be excited about Bitcoin because it allows people to transact financially without permission from somebody else. So why would these same sort of people think that it's okay to, like, engage in just, like, outright censorship campaigns? And I... For me, like, yeah, I'm passionate about the block size debate. I'm even more upset and even more pissed off about the censorship that's been going on. And, and maybe Eric agrees there, maybe he doesn't. But yeah. for me, I think that's, like, an even bigger problem. Like, I got involved with Bitcoin because I want to see Bitcoin change the world for the better, where everyone's in charge of their own money, finally. And we don't need politicians to bossing us around and telling us what we can or can't do. And suddenly these people that are supposed to be, in, you know, in favor of individual sovereignty saying, yeah, well, you can have individual sovereignty and you can say what you want as long as it, you're in agreement with us. And like that really rubs me the wrong way. And granted, like Reddit and these things are like private platforms and the owners can do what they want, but that really doesn't feel like in the spirit, like it's in the spirit of, of Bitcoin at all. Yeah, the, well, I can't get past the irony that you don't need anyone's permission to use the Bitcoin protocol and the Bitcoin network. But we're always coming back to the, in, the sharing of information is where they are still, you know, it's more centralized and where we have to get people's permission. It just doesn't seem to fit to the Bitcoin it, ecosystem at all. Well, the, if you had told people like back in the day that a few years down the road, there would be censorship of topics in the Bitcoin community. Everyone Impossible. Would have, they would would have thought that was ridiculous. As happens so often in politics, you have this sort of um, manipulation of language in a way that makes the censorship seem justified. So specifically in the case of Bitcoin and the block size debate, anyone who was proposing ideas that were not in alignment with what the core development team was doing uh, was suddenly labeled as uh, 
someone who's just promoting an altcoin, right? So if you if you thought that if if your path for Bitcoin was to have larger blocks and that required a hard fork, that meant you were uh, an altcoin, you were an altcoin right. supporter, right? And altcoins are not permitted on on the Bitcoin Reddit, so obviously you can't have that topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. And it was just ridiculous how quickly that sort of sentiment spread to and, and to the point today where a lot of topics that are really important for this industry don't ever end up on on the Bitcoin Reddit because mm -hmm. they've been sort of both explicitly censored in some cases, but also um, just removed by a very angry mob who doesn't want to discuss anything outside of their view. And is that the best place to have Bitcoin discussions these days is still on Bitcoin Reddit? Are, are, are certainly used to be. It used to be. Yeah. At this point, of course, I'm going to recommend Bitcoin.com. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, like we're, there's still more and more traffic growing over there, but uh, there isn't really a best place anymore because of the censorship. Yeah. Before yeah. the censorship, I think our Bitcoin was probably the, the best censorship place. Was, the censorship was what really divided everyone mm -hmm. um, because what was a heated argument suddenly became toxic and, uh, and, and has ca and caused you know Roger to, to set up a, a different Reddit, RBTC, mm -hmm. just to get the other side of the points across where it wouldn't be censored. And so now that other side, you know, both both of those Reddits hate each other and yell at each other all day, and it's totally unproductive. When when the real enemy that that Bitcoiners should be fighting is the legacy financial system, like that's why most people got involved. It yeah, it reminds me of this libertarian infighting yes. that we see all the it's time. Exactly it, it's like, it's like that. the same type of libertarian trolls. They're just Bitcoin trolls now, and they're just yeah. going to fight each other. To prove it's like that they're pe right. pe people that lose sight of the big picture, and they yeah. they get they get bent on on some little nuance that they feel is important, right. and they dig in their heels on it. And they, instead of trying to like empathize with people who disagree with them, they vilify them and attack them and associate them with all sorts of bad intentions. Um, and uh, it's it's tragic, and I don't really know how to how it gets resolved. So that's a little bit of the history. For listeners that don't know exactly what we're talking about as far as the block size, tell us what that is and then maybe some ideas of how you see this being fixed. Yeah, go for it, Robert. So um, I think maybe we should back up a little bit. So when I first got involved in Bitcoin and same with Eric, you know, the market cap of all the Bitcoins in the entire world was less than $10 million, right? Today we're sitting at $8 billion with a B. So when Bitcoin was less than $10 million, uh, all the Bitcoins in the world were less than $10 million. I was looking into it and I one of the big questions that I had was, is this going to be able to scale? Is this going to be able to scale so that you know millions and hundreds of millions and maybe even a billion people plus around the world are able to use it? And, and I looked into that and Satoshi, the creator of Bitcoin, was very, very clear that the ultimate long-term solution is to let the blocks get as big as they need to be. And, uh, and I did the math and I was looking at hard drive sizes at that, uh, at that time and the price and CPU power and I looked at it and I thought, like, Bitcoin can probably keep up with the amount of people that are going to start using it, thanks to Moore's law, like you know, every 18 months or so, everything's doubling, right, at, for the same price. And so I looked into it and I thought, wow, this is going to scale. So yeah, I'm going to put my money in and my time into it. And here I am, you know, six years, six and a half years later. I spent a bunch of money that I earned before I'd ever heard of Bitcoin, investing in the first wave of Bitcoin businesses. I spent six and a half years of my life, almost every waking moment, doing Bitcoin. And now suddenly I feel like a switcheroo has been pulled on me where when I first got involved and for the first couple of years, everybody just knew the blocks are going to get bigger. That's how we're going to scale. And now suddenly another group of new people have come in and said, no, 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 no. We're not going to allow that to happen. We're not going to let the blocks get any bigger. And I feel really betrayed on that because that wasn't what was promised to the original Bitcoiners back when myself and Eric got involved. And I'm all, what actually counts at the end of the day is the transactional throughput of Bitcoin and whether that's done through bigger blocks or something else. I'm okay with any of them, but I, I haven't heard any sound technical reason why two megabyte blocks today aren't doable. Like I did some calculations with my own home system in, in Tokyo and granted the internet speeds there are a little bit faster than other places in the world, but I could easily handle 100 megabyte blocks today. And it just seems crazy that all these people are saying no two megabyte blocks at all. So, Roger, is, and is, I, I know I was supposed to summarize that, the problem there. So anyhow, there's one group of people saying the block size shouldn't get bigger, or at least not now. And, and there's another group of people. Uh, and interestingly enough, I think the people that are predominantly on the bigger block size are the people that were involved in Bitcoin the longest on average. Like there's some exceptions to that, but the earliest Bitcoiners in general seem to be in favor of bigger blocks uh, as a way to scale Bitcoin. Well, certainly. Did I leave anything out there? Um, well, there's 
you left a lot out only because there's a lot of nuances to the whole debate, but uh, certainly a lot of the people that are involved in the business side of things um, overwhelmingly support larger blo blocks. And why is that, Eric? Um, well, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not a technical person, I am a business person, and um, I, I try to have a very, like, high-level view of, of things, and I understand cost-benefit trade-offs, and I, I try not to see things in, in black and white. Um, the reason that larger blocks right now are needed, and not larger blocks to infinity, but just at least one increase for a while to give us some more room, um, is that the, the network is getting full. And uh, it's not completely full yet. It's not in a crisis, but it's getting close and it's growing fast. And if you try to fix something when it's in a crisis, that, that's a problem. And when you add to the context of that, that there are other cryptocurrencies competing for the mind share of businesses, of users, of developers, um, anything that you can get out of the way of Bitcoin to help it grow should be strongly considered. And one of its biggest problems right now is the, is the transaction um, capacity limit, which is causing higher fees, it's causing bad user experience, and uh, I, I think a lot of the developers, they see that increasing the block size adds some degree of risk of centralization, but they're not able to quantify it very well, and they seem to think that any degree of risk on that one vector justifies um, ignoring, or just justifies taking no action to increase the block size. And is the reason that it's, they think that it's going to become more centralized is because it's going to require more processing power and more bandwidth in order to uh, run a full node? Yeah, yeah, basically. So the, the, the argument on one level is sound, which is that if blocks are too big, you will not be able to run one on, on your home, right? And if they get too big, maybe only large institutions and data centers can run them. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you start getting centralized. And, and I, I'm sympathetic to that argument, and it's true. It's a good reason not to have gigabyte blocks today, but it's not a reason not to have two megabyte blocks today. And and with the current one megabyte blocks, if that were to not change, with a, with a $25 Raspberry Pi and then some of all the accessories and everything, including the storage, it, for like $150, you can store, you can run a Bitcoin full node for the next 50 plus years, right, for a $150 piece of hardware today with one megabyte blocks. Like, And, and that's because storage is just so cheap. Yeah, and the CPU can keep up and the bandwidth isn't you know, there's not much required. So, like, to say, like, oh, my God, we're going to be centralized if people can't run a full node on their, you know, $20 smartphone, that's just ridiculous. Well, this, there are people who, who think that if you're not using a full node, you're not actually using Bitcoin because you're relying on someone else. Right. And um, that's that kind of, like, black and white thinking that I think some engineers can be guilty of, that they understand one variable of the problem, but they're not looking at the other variables. Um, just just because not everyone can run a full node doesn't mean it's suddenly Visa and PayPal again, mm -hmm. right? And um, we were talking about this last night, that decentralization is, is something that has diminishing utility the more nodes you add, right? So when you, when you go from a model where there's one central party, PayPal or Visa, um, to, you know, sort of a, a consortium, like 10 or 20, that's, that's really good. You've, you've decentralized something significantly. If you can get that to 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 users, that's great. Now you're getting like excellent decentralization. But going from 10,000 users to 20,000 users is not, you, ha you haven't suddenly doubled the value of the decentralization. And if to get to the 20,000, you hamstring the technology itself to the extent that those people don't even want to use it. Right. Diminishing marginal utility. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, so you're, basically, you're basically sacrificing resources along one vector in order to achieve a, a smaller amount of gain on, an, on another vector. Right. And if you're an engineer only looking at that vector, it makes sense, but that's myopic. Sure. The engineers and a lot of the core developers point to a number of technical reasons and risks to scaling Bitcoin using a block size increase. As businessmen, what do you guys see as user experience degradation today because of a shortage of blocks, blockchain space? Speaking as, as me, who runs Shapeshift, we deal with this uh, quite frequently. So our, in our business, we're moving uh, cryptocurrencies around all the time, and half of that is, is roughly Bitcoin. When, it, when we're moving Bitcoin around, um, we have certain models that if we know it'll get there in 10 or 20 minutes, that, that means we can operate in one way. But if we don't know it'll get there in 10 or 20 minutes, then we have to do things very differently. And if it can take 
you know, not 10 minutes, but three hours, and we don't know which it's going to be, mm -hmm. suddenly that puts far larger capital costs on, on us, and it changes the way we do, we do business. Um, similarly, if someone's sending Bitcoin to us, one of our customers, um, and it doesn't get here for four hours, that creates this huge situation where they think that we've screwed them Stolen or we've screwed it up. It's a customer right. service nightmare. So we get, we get tickets every day from people who sent Bitcoin transactions with a fee, um, and it, it didn't get into a block, right? And it's just because the, bo the blocks during that period got congested. Mm -hmm. It'll still get there, it'll still get to us, but the user experience is, is very much dwindled. Yeah, and from a business perspective, I mean, customer service is always one of your, your loss leaders, and, and having mm -hmm. slow blocks or having clients try to send you coins and it not get there for several hours, I mean, that that's a nightmare yeah. for somebody trying to run a, a a service department. Yeah, and it, it's increasing the fees too. So in order to, if you have a transaction that you know you need to get somewhere in 10 or 20 minutes, you have to start increasing your fee. Mm -hmm. And when the fees in a cryptocurrency transaction rise from, you know, a penny or less than a penny, which it's been for most of the time I've been involved, to 20 or 30 or 40 cents. Right. Um, I mean, the other day we sent a, a $3 fee on a transaction. Wow. It had a, it had a lot of inputs, but $3. Yeah. I mean, that's getting to like almost bank level. It should not cost $3 it's to send. It's an ATM fee. Yeah, it's an ATM fee. It should not cost $3 to send uh, a cryptocurrency transaction. Mm -hmm. Right? If, if that's the level of fees that Bitcoin requires, Bitcoin's going to lose out to other other cryptocurrencies. And that's that risk of losing to other um, market actors, I think, is completely unappreciated by some of the core devs, uh, some of the people who are pushing the small blocks for a long time. I also, I feel like a lot of, and I agree with everything Eric just said, but I feel like a lot of the small block advocates think that nobody could ever use anything other than Bitcoin, that Bitcoin's going to be the end all, be all, center of this crypto coin universe. And that's not the case at all. There's lots and lots of options. And if, if you, if it costs, you know, 30 or 40 or three, $3 to send some Bitcoin, people are going to start looking at all these other options, whether it's Ethereum or Dark Coin or Dogecoin or, you know, there's, there's how many, how many, Crypto coins do you have listed on Coin Market? Oh, we've, got, we've, got, we've got them right here. I mean, there's there's thousand plus, tons, I think, yeah. at this point. and yeah. there and it'll be many more in the future. And right. it's not just cryptocurrencies, though. Too, if it costs three dollars to send a Bitcoin transaction, domestic bank to bank transfers are they basically free. Yeah, yeah or Venmo cheap. is basically free. Like sure. people are still, Bitcoin isn't just competing against other cryptocurrencies; it's competing against the legacy legacy that's financial its, system and that's as its well. Real, that's its real competitor. And yeah. when you when as Bitcoin grows and moves from a system where a million people are using it to to hundreds of millions, which is the goal, the whole thing is pointless if it doesn't become a widespread financial system. When those new people start getting onboarded and experience Bitcoin for the first time, if their experience sucks, you might lose them for a year right. or for a, for a long because time. Because credit cards are easy, especially right. in a lot of these countries right. like Tokyo, I mean, Japan or the United States or all of Europe. Credit right. cards are everywhere. People know how to protect them. People know how to use them. Right? They've got their PIN or their chip or whatever, and they feel secure. Yeah. And... Most people that are in Bitcoin, I think, had that moment early on when they when they used it and it just worked. It was it, magical. It was magical, yeah. right? Like that's the way to describe it when you've had to deal with online payments and credit cards and wires and all that bullshit. And that uh, magic's gone with the full blocks and the you know potential hour long delays right. to to get your payment. And, it, and so it it doesn't mean that the magic is gone for every single user because some users still get their transactions in ten minutes, but. There is a an increasingly large portion of people who just have a horrible experience and leave, and that is that is setting uh, that's setting the the coin up for for failure. Yeah, because a lot of people, especially like in the states, the pain that they experience with the financial system isn't that it's extremely expensive. Because I can send PayPal to any of you guys for for no cost, but the the pain is. The aggravation if something goes wrong if you have to integrate and work with a bank for instance because yeah. nobody's going to pay you any attention with Bitcoin what I'm hoping to see is that it's just easy right it's mm -hmm. like that old easy button that yeah. you know yeah. it's like oh that was easy and when it works right when it it's beautiful it's beautiful it's yeah beautiful. It's, it's magic and when it doesn't it's such a new technology that people are, are, are very uncomfortable with it like mm -hmm. okay like you know I, Roger when we were in uh, Mexico we couldn't get we were trying to send that young couple some Bitcoin and it just it was not confirming it was not confirming and you know it was, it was awkward it's not that's not what we're wanting to do I don't know if that had to do with just our internet or if it had to do with we couldn't get into a block but it just seems like the user experience like Eric said is so key to initial users first-time users 
Because if I can send you a Bitcoin phone to phone, this is something people can't do and it does look like magic. Mm -hmm. Do you guys remember your first Bitcoin transaction? My, my first transaction was from uh, the, the Bitcoin faucet that Gavin Andreessen had set up and it was like magic and I, I think it was, I've gotten half a Bitcoin. I can't remember, it's been a <laughs> while now. But it was worth, you know, maybe 20 cents or something like that at, at the time I received it. But it was like magic. I went there and I think I had to paste my Bitcoin address. And at that time, there was only one Bitcoin wallet, the, the Bitcoin QT client. And I pasted my address in there and then boom, there it was. And it showed up and it was probably a zero fee transaction, uh, yeah, I yeah. suspect. Hmm. And, uh, you know, that was part of what set the light bulb off in my mind when I saw this happen. And it went from some website right there to my, and I understood that like the private keys to spin that Bitcoin were on my own computer mm -hmm. and that that transaction couldn't have been blocked it couldn't have been censored, it couldn't have been controlled. And now I have the ability to send that money that I have on my computer to anybody else and it can't be controlled or censored. Or, and and that, yeah. that, it, that's what got me so excited about Bitcoin. And today takes, that same sort of magical experience yeah. isn't nearly as possible. It takes a lot to pull someone out of their habits and everyone's used to their normal payment systems. And so if, when you're going to them and making the case, use Bitcoin, it's better. Most of the world's not going to care about like the ideological reasons for it. They they should, but they just won't. So they need to have some sort of emotional experience that excites them about its use. And if that experience sucks, they're not going to use it. Right. Yeah. If they don't see it, and like, wow, this is incredible. Yeah. Or or if it doesn't solve a direct pain that they're experiencing. Yeah. Then people don't have a lot of a lot of reason to change. Yeah. Eric, how about you? When was your first Bitcoin transaction? Do you remember? It was probably when I got some coins on Mt. Gox, and I had, I had wired like two thousand dollars to buy some some Bitcoin. And I bought the Bitcoin and I threw it to my wallet, and uh, like that's what you're supposed to do with exchanges. Yes, <laughs> especially with Mt. Gox. <laughs> and I withdrew it. I like clicked with, withdraw and whatever security procedures there were or weren't. Oh, yeah, or weren't. And and as soon as I clicked it, it it showed up in my wallet on my computer, and I was like. I understood how it worked, so I realized like those coins were now on my computer, and that it, it came from this exchange in Tokyo that fast to me without paying a fee or anything. And I was like, obviously this is going to catch on. Like this is this is going to take over the world. Of course, people should be able to send money this way. This is perfect. And uh, to the to the extent that we lose that magic, there are other there are other cryptocurrencies that will take that magic. Yeah, let's talk about some of those other cryptocurrencies because we've seen an altcoin surge recently. I mean, you know, we see Ethereum back above $12 again. We even see Litecoin back above $4. I'm looking at my CoinCap app on my uh, cell phone here. Um, what's going on here? Is it is it hedging against Bitcoin? Is it doubts that the Bitcoin ecosystem can govern itself using its current protocol? I mean, I know Dash is quite a bit different. Um, so it's, it's complicated. Um, ever since Namecoin, which is sort of the first, you know, altcoin came out, um, it's just been this Cambrian explosion of uh, people experimenting with this technology, which is great. Um, that that increases the um, decentralization of the industry, right? We don't just have we don't just like Bitcoin because it has nodes all over the world. We like this industry because it has different types of blockchains, and if one has a failure, there might be others that, that spring up and take over. This is the the Hydra concept. This is why this technology is going to completely take over the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a good phenomenon, but I, and, and people, people are always looking for opportunities. So some people create these altcoins just to pump and dump and make some money sure. and there's not value in the actual asset, but some other, some other tokens are try to do things differently than Bitcoin or to serve a need that Bitcoin's not filling or to, to just do something brand new. And a lot of these things are complementary to Bitcoin. Um, for example, as soon as people started realizing that Bitcoin wasn't as anonymous as was originally portrayed, under, by, portrayed, the media, yeah. portrayed by the media, mm -hmm. um, it was right around that time when some of the anonymous coins started coming out and, and people got to work like, okay, well, if this isn't, if you can track along the blockchain with Bitcoin, then let's make coins that you can't do that. Right. And so now you have Bitcoin and you have things like Dash and Monero and, uh, and Zcash, which is coming out. This is all. This is all very good. But what it means is that if, if Bitcoin uh, fails in what it has done so well, which is to be a peer-to-peer -peer cash system, um, if it fails in that, there will be other other tokens that come to, to take that place. As we would expect. Yeah. I, I can remember back, you know, 2013 or so, where 
I was convincing people of like, hey, no, we don't just need Bitcoin. We need all of these altcoins, just like we want gold and silver and platinum, you know, as free market money. We, we need all these altcoins because it's a test bed. And maybe Bitcoin can incorporate some of this stuff. Maybe it can't. But we're not, you know, we're not any worse off by having other altcoin or crypto options. We don't have to use them. But maybe somebody invents something that Bitcoin hasn't figured out yet or mm -hmm. Bitcoin can't implement because it's so grand in, in scale now. Mm -hmm. Roger, how do you see the, the altcoin surge recently as the owner of Bitcoin.com and, and investing most heavily in Bitcoin companies throughout your time? I, I think it's a direct result of people worrying that Bitcoin's not going to be allowed to scale fast enough to keep up with the amount of people that want to use it. And that's why we're seeing all these other traditional Bitcoin businesses integrating altcoins I think it's not because they're such giant fans of the altcoins. It's because Bitcoin doesn't have the transactional throughput to grow for many more months. Like we're we're like right at the the cusp there of of the blocks being completely full all the time, and then people just having to bid against each other to get included in those blocks. And uh, I think that's a real shame, and I feel a bit betrayed myself after having spent this much time and money with the original vision of Bitcoin in mind, and now it's been completely changed, and they're claiming that it needs to be used as a settlement layer rather than peer-to-peer -peer cash. Um, so. Just quickly on that point, there's there's this notion in Bitcoin that, so theoretically uh, with one megabyte blocks you can have like a max of seven transactions a second and in reality it's like four or five or something. Um, and some people have argued that, well, sure, and when it gets full the fees start increasing and so you can always get into a block if you just pay enough, pay enough right? And, and people who are disposed to free market ideals uh, can often be sympathetic to that to that idea. The problem is that if there are seven important transactions in a second that all need to go in, there isn't you, you can pay infinite fee and, and you will not get in. The system cannot support more than seven transactions per second. And so there is there is a ceiling in terms of how much important business can be done on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, regardless of the fee. And if people have to pay fees that are outrageous, they're not they're not going to use it in the first place. And I'd like to point out that the original Bitcoin white paper, the title of it is Bitcoin: A Peer-to-Peer -peer Electronic Cash System. It's, <laughs> it's not a peer, it's not a peer-to-peer -peer settlement system. It's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, and that's completely being subverted at this point. And they're trying to turn it into just a settlement layer rather than a peer-to-peer -peer cash system. And that doesn't seem very fair to all the people that got involved, based on the original white paper. I, I will I will defend the the small block crowd uh, in to some degree. A lot of them, some of them are just trolls and throwing out like just vilifying people and causing mayhem. But that's true of everyone on the internet. Um, but there there are some certainly core developers and people who support them that have honest concerns that that care a lot about the project and want to be really careful. They don't want to just be hasty and increase blocks because they they you know they. They don't want to move too quickly when they have when when the system has worked so well in its current design, and I I'm sympathetic to that and I understand it. Um, the problem is that and, and a lot of those people actually support larger blocks, but just kind of over a much more conservative time frame, a much more a much longer time frame. And I, I think those people don't appreciate the the risk that Bitcoin faces if it doesn't scale. Fast enough. Right. We don't want to be a little club that can use Bitcoin. I mean, the, the idea is to send this worldwide and have you know two billion people using it one day. Yeah. I mean, we always talk about the unbanked as well. But how I, are the, how I, are the unbanked going to use Bitcoin if it's going to charge you know fifty cents a transaction? I think all the people at this table want Bitcoin to be used by billions of people. But just recently at the consensus conference in New York, I had the chance to ask a bunch of the the Bitcoin core members, "What is your goal with in, your involvement in Bitcoin? What what does success?" mean to you with Bitcoin and none of them said that I want to see every you know billions of people around the world using it in fact one of them was very clear like as long as me and my friends get to use Bitcoin and nobody can control it that's good enough for me and it does I don't care if anybody else is using Bitcoin other than my little club and that's not the Bitcoin that I signed up for and it really bothered me to hear him say that and I asked him well what about you know Satoshi he originally said very clearly he wanted on-chain scaling through bigger blocks and his reply to me was a four-letter word mm. regarding Satoshi and that yeah. That really rubbed me the wrong way. It, do you think it's because they're not ideologically drawn to the freedom aspect of Bitcoin? It's more just the monetary aspect. Do, do they not care about? I don't think it's opposite? anything so complicated. I think it's I think it's that they see a risk in larger blocks of centralizing. It. Centralizing it is bad. Thus, they cannot increase the size of the blocks. Mm -hmm. And and 
a lot of people that sounds kind of like a silly and myopic viewpoint, but I, I've met engineers who have this way of thinking. They they'll bite into an issue, and if they see anything that is a risk, they will they will try to avoid it. And that's why a lot of the business people I think at Bitcoin understand that like the world is full of risks. You can't get rid of all risks. Uh, there's always a cost benefit to anything that you're doing. And I'd also like to point out, I don't think it's their decision to make. Um, the original people signed up for the original vision of Bitcoin, and now these new people have come in, and they said, hey, we're going to run the show, and we're going to change the course of the project. I don't think that's their decision uh, to make there. How does this get, decision get made? Because that's a, a big part of this problem, is the, the governance model, and, and how do you decide on a course of action? Well, of course, the irony is that the argument against the major argument against larger blocks is one of avoiding centralization. Uh, and yet, the development of Bitcoin, the underlying protocol, is very centralized in a couple dozen individuals. And the mining is very centralized in a very, couple of pools. Yes. So there, there's already uh, strong centralization in certain parts of, of Bitcoin. It's it's just another fact that makes it kind of silly to say, well, we can't increase blocks because there might be there might be some centralization. I'd also like to point out that we don't know if increasing the block size will lead to any more centralization. It could be, right now around the world today, there's somewhere around you know, five or 6,000 nodes that accept incoming connections. And we have maybe on the generous side, 10 million people using Bitcoins around the world and that you know, whatever number of businesses are required to support that many people. So it's some you know, very small percentage of those people are running a full node. And I, I've had some disagreements with, I guess, Peter Todd and some other people talking about, is it the t absolute number of full nodes that is important for decentralization, or is it the percentage of, or is it the, is it the percentage of people that are running full nodes? And I've thought about this for several months. <coughs> I think the important thing is the absolute number of full nodes, not the percentage of full nodes. And I know other people disagree with me on this, but I have yet to hear an argument why that isn't the case. And so if more and more people around the world are able to use Bitcoin through bigger blocks, even if it takes a more expensive uh, piece of computing hardware to run a full node, suddenly if we have 100 million or a billion people and the supporting businesses using Bitcoin, maybe we'll have 50,000 full nodes. Even though that would be a smaller percentage of the people that are using Bitcoin, it's a larger absolute number of full nodes. And to me, I think that means more decentralization than we have today with only 5,000 full nodes. Yeah, I think a system used by 100 million people with 20,000 nodes is much better than a system used by one million people with with uh, you know five thousand nodes. Um, the percentage in the latter case is higher, so you could make the argument that the latter has a higher percentage of decentralization. But it's kind of a, a meaningless point, right? The the former with more people and more nodes on net is a, a more much robust, more useful tool. a much more useful tool, more utility, um, will support a larger amount of actual commerce and and ultimately is more decentralized and will be more censorship resistant. What about the, the fee market? One of the big arguments is that keeping a block cap and some scarcity of space every 10 minutes creates a free market which is needed for the miners going forward. How would you guys see a fee market if blocks were two megabytes or that, that wasn't even a concern? I think the fee market isn't needed for several decades because we still have the, the mining reward yeah. until then. And if Bitcoin's allowed to grow, today Bitcoin's 500 and something dollars, right? If we, if we have 10 times more people and more commerce going through the Bitcoin system, they'll suddenly be $5,000 a Bitcoin, right? And at $5,000 a Bitcoin, you know, the, the block reward can drop several times, right? And it only, it only drops every four years. We have several decades before we need to worry about a fee market to replace yeah. The, the, the block reward. I, so we're so early on that we shouldn't even be worrying about it at this point. And something so new and experimental, which has such a sort of binary outcome where it's either going to take over the world or fail and collapse, um, trying to build it so that a problem, a, a theoretical problem 50 years from now will be averted is not a good prioritization of resources, right? Like, the, I understand the fee market, like, at some point in Bitcoin's future. There is a certain amount of fees needed to 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 incentivize the hashing that makes the network secure. That that will happen gradually over time. That is not the main risk today. And, and as an engineer, uh, previous work doing a lot of engineering, I can tell you that technical people like to see problems way out in the future and try mm -hmm. to fix them and tinker with them right now and be blind to the ones in front of them. Right. Exactly. Right. I mean, what's what's a bigger risk to Bitcoin? That that a lack of fee market will cause hash power to decrease a few decades from now, or that 
if Ethereum keeps growing and people start using that for transactions instead of Bitcoin, Bitcoin will just fall fall to zero and will be just part of the cryptocurrency history books. Right. Like, what's what's a bigger threat? Right. Roger, is it going to require Satoshi actually coming out and making a declaration? No, and and Satoshi's not God either. Um, obviously, whoever he was was a really, really, really smart guy. But really smart people can be wrong about all sorts of things. Um, and we, we see that you know, with Stephen Hawking. He has no clue when it comes to economics, mm -hmm. but he knows a heck of a lot more about astrophysics than I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it could be the same way with, with lots of really smart people. They're really smart in their purview, but when it comes to other things, they're missing the, the bigger picture. Yeah, so. I, don't, I don't think if Satoshi came out and had an opinion on the issue, it would... Uh change the discussion. I mean, he and was, we already know his We already position. know his position. He, it was bigger blocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plain and simple. But but again, like just because he thought that that that's the Satoshi's desire Satoshi's writing about the desire for larger blocks when they start getting full is like the the worst argument for for larger blocks. Like of all the arguments that you can make, that one's one of the weakest, right? The better ones are the ones about scale, about business utility, about the system actually being useful for real users who are doing it for actual financial transactions. Well, I think we all agree that larger blocks are not only required, but it's going to be imperative to have them to scale Bitcoin and, and help bring Bitcoin to the masses like we like we think we're trying to yeah. do, like we think we want to do. And one, one of the things that's been upsetting about this debate is that it's been seen in the sort of black and white, like you're either for bigger blocks or you're against them. Um, and that's not that's not the case. Just because I support uh, a marginally larger block now doesn't mean I think that blocks should always be increased forever when there's scaling issues. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, I don't I don't know that all I don't think all scaling should happen on the blockchain. There are a lot of ways it should. But should it go from one megabyte to two megabyte right now, given the current like threats to Bitcoin and, and where it is today? Yeah, for sure. So let's take it back a little bit to the old school, since we have two guys that have been in Bitcoin for a very long time. What's something now? that you could have only dreamed of back in 2011, say, in the Bitcoin space. And let's try to project that five more years from now. Where do you see Bitcoin? I mean, I remember arguing with people on the forums back in the day, like when when will Microsoft or, or a, a Dell like, ever accept Bitcoin as payment? And people would say, well, that's never going to happen. Like, you guys are just totally dreaming. You, you, um, this... You can buy your a pack of socks, fine, but this is never going to be a real payment system for anything. A real. libertarian type of thing. Yeah, you're just a bunch of like branches. tinfoil hack guys. Like right. you're all a bunch of crazies. Um, and a couple of years later, Dell and Microsoft are accepting Bitcoin, and you know you can get pretty much anything you need with Bitcoin at this point. And it's grown way beyond that. I mean, you have every major financial institution in the world researching this technology and trying to figure out how to incorporate it into what they're doing. It has gone very quickly from like a, a joke of people online to the way finance is going to be done and everyone's jostling over the, the details, not whether it will happen or not. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I try to just like look back and realize that that's happening. You know, that I don't even get excited when Bitcoin's mentioned in the Wall Street Journal. It's like, okay. It's almost daily at this it's, point. Yeah, it's all the time. Either blockchain or Bitcoin or something. Yeah. It's all, Whereas when we got involved in Bitcoin, I remember, you know, maybe once a month there would be some mention of Bitcoin in the mainstream media, and everybody on the forum would be so excited about oh, that. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. my, and it was just, you know, one little blurb or mention, where now there's more mentions in the media every single day than any human being could ever even possibly hope to keep up with. It, it reminds me back in the day during, like, Ron Paul's 2007 and eight presidential campaign. As soon as somebody would cover him, we'd just flock and watch the video and comment and, you know, just get all excited. You know, Bitcoin, especially when it, I didn't come into Bitcoin until 2013, but I could tell that there was a very similar energy. I almost said synergy, but you don't like that word, Justin. It's a great word. Just overused. <laughs> There's a very special energy about it where, you know, you see like WordPress or somebody start to accept Bitcoin and, and you just, you can't believe it. it's like one of the best days of your life that day. Yeah. Like I, I, I really want that magic to come back like we were talking about. And I think a big part of the reason why that magic got, is gone at the moment is because of the censorship. Like, I think one thing that everybody should agree on, and they don't, is that, like, let other people state their point of view. Don't just, like, erase it from the history books there. And, yeah. uh, you know, to name names, like Thamos, man, if you claim you're a libertarian or a voluntarist and you're just, like, wiping dissenting opinions off, you know, everywhere, I don't want to be, if, if that's what, you know, being a libertarian means, don't count me in. It's it's bad because the some people have have like looked and found the wrong enemy, right? And and there are people who see 
others in the cryptocurrency industry as the enemy because they don't it's it's almost like religion where they don't they don't see uh, Bitcoin in exactly the same way um, so it's like the Protestants right like they were they were the demons right mm -hmm. and, and there were wars fought between the Catholics and the Protestants because they had a, a slightly differing view of how of how Jesus wanted people to act right um, and I see the, the same kind of thing in the Bitcoin world and it's ridiculous because Bitcoin has the entire world to conquer right it has this horrible fiat fractional reserve banking system that has poisoned humanity like you enslaved can't ask humanity. enslaved humanity you can't ask for a better villain like sitting out there waiting for you to fight it right and, and there's all this in fight and you're sitting here and you're sitting here censoring someone who who wants a fork of bitcoin to two megabytes and calling that person like a witch and saying burn them and get them off of this page you've made that the enemy and that's now the fight instead of the big demon the in the money, sky. The money masters printing trillions of dollars. Yeah, every and I, year. I can't, I can't understand why. What would lead someone to, to come to that opinion? Mm. To just, it's, it's, it's exactly you know not seeing the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did a poll recently on the Bitcoin.com forums, asking people, are you more upset about the slowness or the lack of scaling in Bitcoin, or the censorship that's going on? And it was like 70% of the people were more upset about the censorship than the slowness of scaling. And myself included in that camp, I'm, I'm more angry about the censorship going on than the actual slowness of scaling. Like slowness of scaling, like, yeah, I'm, I'm annoyed by that and I want things to scale faster, but the censorship has me way more upset. Yeah, because without that conversation, we, we can't come to a, an agreement and actually put, implement the scaling procedures. The censorship is bad, equally as bad is the, the vilification of people and the assuming of bad intentions, and this has happened on all mm -hmm. sides of the debate. There, there have been people who want larger blocks who have vilified some of the core developers, believe that they're all just in, in bed with Blockstream and receiving VC money in order to torpedo Bitcoin for some crazy reason. There I completely agree with Eric on this point. I yeah. think all sides of the debate have good intentions. Even even the you know Thamos integrating the censorship there on, on Reddit, I think he has good intentions. He's just really going about it the wrong way, but yeah. especially with the, the core team. Like I think all of them have good intentions. They just have different viewpoints and different yeah. ways step, to get there. Step one in, in healing the community, I think, is for people to just become friendly with each other again and realize that like we are all friends and we have some differences on some of this nuanced technical stuff, but none of us are trying to destroy Bitcoin, right? I mean, Roger's been... People have said that Roger is trying to destroy Bitcoin. <laughs> Which is like they must have bought crack with their bitcoins yeah. if they think that. <laughs> There's a new Silk Road somewhere. <laughs> it's crazy, and then and then on the other side, there are people that that are saying that some of the core developers are trying to kill Bitcoin, which is equally as absurd. Like people have dedicated their lives, their fortunes, and their reputations to this project. Um, they none of them are trying to kill Bitcoin. Yeah, they're all they're all just trying to to build it. None of us really know what's best. We're all trying to just discuss it, figure it out, but. Preventing that discussion from happening, I think, is a huge, huge problem. Yes. Discussion is important. Yes, and, it, and assuming the worst about people who disagree with you is, is going to make the conversation toxic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, guys, I really appreciate both of you joining us today. It's been an amazing conversation. Um, I hope that in some small part, Liberty Entrepreneurs can help push forward the larger block size debate. We will not censor anyone, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, whether you think the block should be larger or smaller, that's not really the point of this conversation. That the point is like these things need to be discussed maturely as adults with each other, and often it just takes people being in the same room with each other to actually mm -hmm. do that. I think. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Eric. I wonder how many of these people online that are so upset if we actually sat in this conference room, they would be that trollish. Pe people don't act the way that people act online to each other is not how they act in real life. And it's fine if you want to like throw barbs at other people because you don't care about who they are. But if they're if they're like your your brothers in an important project, like give them a little bit of courtesy, right? You know, even the ones you disagree with. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Any any last comments or? I think that's it for me. Yeah. Cool. Bit Bitcoin's going to change the world. Visit Bitcoin.com to learn more. <laughs> the uncensored <laughs> website. <laughs> and I will say, Eric, you were saying how it's taken a long time. At, for some users to use Shapeshift and get their coins. I've used it several times over the past week and it was super fast. I even tweeted about it. That means it's the blocks aren't full, so we don't need to care <laughs> about it anymore. I was trading one altcoin to another altcoin. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, I was trading like a tenth of a bit. Uh, <laughs> all right, guys, thank you so much. Eric Cheers. Roger, thanks. Yeah. Thank you.
thanks again to our guests Roger Veer and Eric Voorhees. The show is hosted by Ash Whitener and Justin Blinko. If you like the podcast, you can find show notes at libertyentrepreneurs.com and you can connect with us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast or Facebook.com slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Please share Liberty Entrepreneurs with a friend and until next time, keep building freedom. Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. Today we have a very special episode with a slightly different format. We usually have a discussion of entrepreneurship and the freedom it can bring to your personal life. But instead, today's episode is an in-depth conversation about Bitcoin with two of its earliest pioneers, Roger Veer and Eric Voorhees. Both Roger and Eric were very early Bitcoin entrepreneurs who have funded and founded more companies than we have time to announce. It it has gone very quickly from like a, a joke of people online to the way finance is going to be done and everyone's jostling over the, the details, not whether it will happen or not. We find out how Roger and Eric met each other at the first Bitcoin conference. We discuss the Bitcoin scaling debate in depth that has divided the Bitcoin community. We find out their thoughts on the recent altcoin surge, and of course, their stories from the early days in Bitcoin and dive into the predictions about the future of cryptocurrency. Is it the absolute number of full nodes that is important for decentralization, or is it the percentage? If you'd like to be notified when Liberty Entrepreneurs releases new episodes, head on over to our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com, and subscribe with your email. You can find the show notes and all other relevant information posted on our website as well. This is a really exciting interview. I'm really glad that we were able to get Roger and Eric on the show at the same time, and I hope you enjoy this most excellent discussion. So welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm very pleased today to have my co-host Justin Blinko as well as Eric Voorhees and Roger Veer with us. We're going to be discussing a lot of Bitcoin today, so I hope everyone is ready. So Eric, Roger, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. I can't imagine that anybody in the Bitcoin space don't know who you guys are, but just give a very quick bio, Eric, and then Roger. So uh, yeah, I'm Eric Voorhees. I currently run Shapeshift. Uh, which is a digital asset exchange to convert between Bitcoin and other blockchain assets without any uh, user accounts or signups or friction or anything like that. Um, notoriously, I, I was also the, the founder of uh, Satoshi Dice, and I've been involved in a number of other Bitcoin companies over the years. Um, I've been involved since 2011, and so that makes me kind of a, an elder, an elder Bitcoiner at this point. From the old school. From the old school days, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Roger Veer. Uh, I guess I was the first person to start investing in Bitcoin startups and uh, met Eric at, at the very first Bitcoin conference ever in New York City in fall of 2011 mm-hmm. when Bitcoins were a couple of dollars each, I think, maybe at that yeah. point. And, uh, they were about $8 yeah. on their way down from 30 Right, yes. And uh, but we still felt like we were on the verge of changing the world. And yeah. here we are a few years later and we are on the verge of changing the world. Absolutely. Um, and then I think one of my favorite things that I've done, and I don't know how appreciated it is in the community, but uh, I set up BitcoinStore.com, which was the first big website to start accepting Bitcoin for hundreds of thousands of products. And we sold millions of dollars worth of products for Bitcoin. And that was before we had Overstock and, and uh, Newegg and Tiger Direct and all these other companies that are accepting Bitcoin today. And I kind of feel like that was a big catalyst to help move the whole ecosystem forward. So that's yeah, one of the, the things I like. In the early days, people would always say, well, what can you buy with it? Right. And like... Early on, there kind of really wasn't a good answer. Alpaca there was the, socks. I was going to say alpaca socks. There was the alpaca farm <laughs> up in Vermont that sold alpaca socks. Uh, you baklava? There was, uh, yeah, there was some baklava. That might have been later, though. Um, but Roger's like, well, I'll show you what you can buy with it. You can buy anything. You can buy, like, 10 million products with it. At uh, prices competitive with Amazon mm-hmm. and everyone else, too. So it yep. worked out pretty well. No one, no one asks what you can buy with Bitcoin anymore. Not really. No. That yeah. battle has been won. Tell us more about when you guys met and which conference was this and like, did, you, did you know about each other prior? No, but I, I, I'd like to tell this story because it was a really interesting experience. So 
we were at the New York conference and I didn't know Eric and Eric came up to me and just said, I think we should talk. And I said, okay. And then uh, he said, you know, I'm involved with the Free State Project in New Hampshire and we, I think we have very similar interests. And the part that stuck in my mind the most, you know, here we are about almost six years later, he handed me his business card and his business card said, I'm friends with Satoshi. <laughs> and it had his, his name and, and email address and maybe a phone number as well. But I thought that, uh, wow, this guy has a pretty memorable business card. So uh, Eric's always been very good at marketing. And from the very first time I met him, that that was one of the most memorable memorable business cards I've ever received in the ever, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and Eric, you'd known about Roger prior to that conference. I think I, I, think I may have known about Roger maybe from Free Talk Live. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I, th- I knew about memory dealers, and so Roger sort of indirectly through that. When I first talked to you, we were at that eatery, that like bakery place in New York. There was dinner. The staff there was accepting Bitcoin, and but the, all the apps and systems were so terrible. There you was know, no BitPay yet. There, there was were no, no BitPay. There were no app wallets. The BitPay guys, Steve and Tony, were there. Yeah. Uh, that, they were just getting their company started. So this restaurant actually accepted Bitcoin, but just to have Bitcoin on your phone required having a full node <laughs> on your phone. So, well, I I had my girlfriend's Android and it had uh, like a six gigabyte node on it, which we thought was ridiculous because that was the size of the blockchain back then. Yeah, and maybe the entire storage of the phone back then. Yeah, she made me kick off the the node after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I remember Roger saying something about um, Hayek or or some Liberty guy, and I I was like, yes, let's do it, <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, it was the start of a good relationship. So you could run a full note on your phone back then. That's not possible today, most likely. Maybe there's some phone that could do it's it. It's still possible today. Is it? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. The blockchain's what, 70 gigabytes? You can buy 128 <laughs> gigabyte SD cards, 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, There's no reason that people should run a full note on their phone, but even today it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's segue into the, this this scaling <laughs> debate uh, that, that's torn the community apart in the, the last few years. I think it's, asunder is the right term. Asunder. Asunder. It's torn it asunder. Yeah. So the first few years of your guys' involvement in Bitcoin, there wasn't a uh, lightning rod of, of disagreement. Everyone pretty much agreed in the direction. This has kind of come about over the last two years. So how have you seen that evolve, and well, there, how do you see it maybe being solved? There's always been a lot of controversy, but usually there would be like five or six or ten sides to the argument and so everyone would just kind of bicker about things and then on the next issue they would all be on different sides and so it was like a very sort of decentralized argumentation (laughs) platform but there's always been drama I mean when Satoshi Dice launched I I was ridiculed by a number of people because I was polluting the blockchain Mm. so using it for a a reason that they didn't approve of which I always I always found silly but that was highly controversial but even then, people had like nuances to their arguments, and so there was uh, it was a rich discussion. And I think it, today now, unfortunately, it's, it's much more polemic, and the block size debate has turned people into like two distinct camps, or that's the perception at least. Mm-hmm. And then the, when there's two distinct camps, there's always a there's always the tendency to just vilify the other, right? That's yeah. just a human nature situation. Yeah, we see this in politics all the time. We see it in politics, we see it in religion, we see it in sports. Right. If I can take a moment to specifically vilify one side in the argument, <laughs> the, the big block side should be ashamed of the censorship that's been going on and not even allowing the people that are, I'm sorry, the, the small block side should be ashamed of the censorship that they've been having uh, on both, you know, our Bitcoin, BitcoinTalk.org, even Bitcoin.org. Like, we're all Bitcoiners. We all should be excited about Bitcoin because it allows people to transact financially without permission from somebody else. So why would these same sort of people think that it's okay to like engage in just like outright censorship campaigns? And I, for me, like yeah, I'm passionate about the block size debate. I'm even more upset and even more pissed off about the censorship that's been going on. And and maybe Eric agrees there. Maybe he doesn't. But yeah. for me, I think that's like an even bigger problem. Like I got involved with Bitcoin because I want to see Bitcoin change the world for the better where everyone's in charge of their own money finally. And we don't need politicians to bossing us around and telling us what we can or can't do. And suddenly these people that are supposed to be in in favor of individual sovereignty saying, yeah, well, you can have individual sovereignty and you can say what you want as long as you're in agreement with us. And like that really rubs me the wrong way. And granted, like Reddit and these things are like private platforms and the owners can do what they want, but that really doesn't feel like in the spirit, like it's in the spirit of, of Bitcoin at all. Yeah, the, well, I, I can't get past the irony that you don't need anyone's permission to use the Bitcoin protocol and the Bitcoin network, 
but we're always coming back to the in, the sharing of information is where they are still you know it's more centralized and where we have to get people's permission. It just doesn't seem to fit to the Bitcoin it, ecosystem at all. Well, the if you had told people like back in the day that a few years down the road there would be censorship of topics in the Bitcoin community, everyone would have, they would would have thought that was ridiculous. As happens so often in politics, you have this sort of um, manipulation of language in a way that makes the censorship seem justified. So specifically in the case of Bitcoin and the block size debate, anyone who was proposing ideas that were not in alignment with what the core development team was doing uh, was suddenly labeled as uh, someone who's just promoting an altcoin, right? So if you, if you thought that if, if your path for Bitcoin was to have larger blocks and that required a hard fork, that meant you were uh, an altcoin. you were an altcoin supporter, right? And altcoins are not permitted on on the Bitcoin Reddit, so obviously you can't have that topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. And it was just ridiculous how quickly that sort of sentiment spread to and and to the point today where a lot of topics that are really important for this industry don't ever end up on on the Bitcoin Reddit because mm -hmm. they've been sort of both explicitly censored in some cases, but also um, just removed by a very angry mob who doesn't want to discuss anything outside of their view. And is that the best place to have Bitcoin discussions these days is still on Bitcoin Reddit? Our, our, our it certainly used to be. It used to be. Yeah. At this point, of course, I'm going to recommend Bitcoin.com. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, like we're, there's still more and more traffic growing over there, but uh, there isn't really a best place anymore because of the censorship. Yeah. Before yeah. the censorship, I think our Bitcoin was probably the, the best censorship place. Was, the censorship was what really divided everyone. Mm -hmm. um, because what was a heated argument suddenly became toxic and uh, and and has ca and caused you know Roger to to set up a, a different Reddit RBTC mm -hmm. just to get the other side of the points across where it wouldn't be censored, and so now that other side, you know, both both of those Reddits hate each other and yell at each other all day, and it's totally unproductive. When when the real enemy that that Bitcoiners should be fighting is the legacy financial system, like that's why most people got involved. Yeah, it reminds me of this libertarian infighting yes. that we see all the it's time. Exactly it, it's like, like the same type of libertarian trolls. They're just Bitcoin trolls now, and they're just yeah. going to fight each other. To prove it's like that pe right. pe people that lose sight of the big picture, and they, yeah. they, get, they get bent on, on some little nuance that they feel is important, right. and they dig in their heels on it, and they, instead of trying to like empathize with people who disagree with them, they vilify them and attack them and associate them with all sorts of bad intentions. Um, and uh, it's, it's tragic, and I don't really know how to how it gets resolved. So that's a little bit of the history. For listeners that don't know exactly what we're talking about as far as the block size, tell us what that is and then maybe some ideas of how you see this being fixed. Yeah, go for it, Robbie. So um, I think maybe we should back up a little bit. So when I first got involved in Bitcoin and same with Eric, you know, the market cap of all the Bitcoins in the entire world was less than $10 million. Right? Today we're sitting at $8 billion with a B. So when Bitcoin was less than $10 million, uh, all the Bitcoins in the world were less than $10 million. I was looking into it, and I, one of the big questions that I had was, is this going to be able to scale? Is this going to be able to scale so that you know millions and hundreds of millions and maybe even a billion people plus around the world are able to use it? And, and I looked into that, and Satoshi, the creator of Bitcoin, was very, very clear that the ultimate long-term solution is to let the blocks get as big as they need to be. And, uh, and I did the math, and I was looking at hard drives sizes at that, uh, at that time and the price and CPU power and I looked at it and I thought like Bitcoin can probably keep up with the amount of people that are going to start using it thanks to Moore's law like mm -hmm. you know every 18 months or so everything's doubling right at, for the same price and so I looked into it and I thought wow this is going to scale so yeah I'm going to put my money in and my time into it and here I am you know six years six and a half years later I spent a bunch of money that I earned before I'd ever heard of Bitcoin investing in the first wave of Bitcoin businesses. I spent six and a half years of my life, almost every waking moment, doing Bitcoin. And now suddenly I feel like a switcheroo has been pulled on me where when I first got involved and for the first couple of years, everybody just knew the blocks are going to get bigger. That's how we're going to scale. And now suddenly another group of new people have come in and said, no, 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 no. We're not going to allow that to happen. We're not going to let the blocks get any bigger. And I feel really betrayed on that because that wasn't what was promised to the original Bitcoiners back when myself and Eric got involved. And I'm all, what actually counts at the end of the day is the transactional throughput of Bitcoin and whether that's done through bigger blocks or something else. I'm okay with any of them, but I, I haven't heard any sound technical reason why two megabyte blocks today 
aren't doable. Like I did some calculations with my own home system in, in Tokyo, and granted, the internet speeds there are a little bit faster than other places in the world, but I could easily handle 100 megabyte blocks today. And it just seems crazy that all these people are saying no two megabyte blocks at all. So, Roger, is, and is, I, I know I was supposed to summarize that, the problem there. So anyhow, there's one group of people saying the block size shouldn't get bigger, or at least not now, and, and there's another group of people. Uh, and interestingly enough, I think the people that are predominantly on the bigger block size are the people that were involved in Bitcoin the longest on average. Like there's some exceptions to that, but the earliest Bitcoiners in general seem to be in favor of bigger blocks. Uh, as a way to scale Bitcoin. Well, certainly, Did I leave anything out there? 